Um, so welcome, Erica. Um, please take it from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anne. And thanks again to Legal Aid for hosting this training today. Um, it's such a pleasure and honor to be with you all on this beautiful Friday. Glad uh, spring decided to <laughs> come back in town since uh, earlier this week, Mother Nature was playing games. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so we have covered a lot. Thank you, Shamas. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I know I learned a ton and I hope all the participants here today did as well. Um, so I'm here to talk about funding. Um, and in the great words of Wu-Tang Klang, uh, cash rules everything around me, cream get the money, dollar dollar bills y'all. So uh, just shout out to huge hip hop fan, New Yorker over here. <laughs> so <laughs> a little throwback for y'all. Um, so just a brief overview of what I'll be covering today. Uh, I have a brief introductory prompt, uh, so be prepared to come off mute. I was not a fourth grade teacher like Catherine, but I have no problem calling on people. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the state of capital and social change. Um, I'm probably gonna skip over organizational structure because uh, I am not an attorney and Catherine did a far better job <laughs> than I could in talking about all the different legal structures. Um, capacity to raise money, the power of narrative and storytelling, uh, the different types of funding available and and then we'll return back to our hypothetical uh, where we started this morning. All right, so we're gonna start with this brief prompt. Uh, pretty simple question, maybe, maybe not, we'll see. Uh, what is capital? When you hear the word capital, what comes to mind? So you may share in the chat um, and then I will ask a few folks to unmute themselves and come off. Um, we could be talking about DC, the capital there. We could be talking about a lot of different things, um, but I'm just curious when folks hear the word capital, what comes to mind? And Natalie, if you can just help me out if there are comments coming in the chat, it's kind of hard to see both while sharing. For sure, we've got a lot of comments coming in the chat. I'll read some out. Uh, we have dollar signs, so money, resources, power, money, resources, connections, money to spend, equity, resources and wealth, resources, opportunity, relevant factors, money, property and wealth. Thank you. Does anyone that provided a comment wanna come off mute and share a little bit more about the, the comment or the word that they provided? Sure, I will. <laughs> Um, so um, I think of capital as being kind of like ingredients, you know, so there's all different kinds of capital. It could be something tangible like the land around you or green space, or it could be money, or it could be your connection to city council or your connection to these people who, you know, own like a construction company or your, or these people who are really in charge of the neighborhood group or whatever it might be. So it's kind of, I think of capital because there's all different kinds of capital. So it's, it's like they're, it's, we're making a dinner, everybody hears all the ingredients. And so it's kind of taking the ingredients and trying to make something that we all wanna eat, I guess. <laughs> I usually use the analogy of like a dope chili, Sarah. <laughs> you know, yeah. a, little this, a little bit of that. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming off mute and sharing that uh, and you're spot on. And I'll, and I'll get to that here in just a second. Anyone else wanna come off mute and share their comment? McCall, I feel like I just have to choose you because of <laughs> the organization you work for. So what well, do you think about? I mean, clearly um, money is a major thing that comes to mind because of what we do. For those that don't know, we are a 118-year-old nonprofit that provides interest-free loan for those that don't have access to fair financial resources. So we try and be that capital, be it for personal or, or small business or education. Um, but it goes beyond that. It's, it's pe people having the right connections is unfortunately how, how that works a lot. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in Israel and the word was protexia. If you, if you kind of had someone you knew in the right place who could uh, get you connected. And unfortunately, um, a lot of people we work with just don't, don't have that. And they, 
need advocates so that their voices are heard and they know that their voices are just as important. 100%. Thank you all. And thank you for the folks that shared in the chat. So that's exactly it. Uh, there are multiple forms of capital. Um, I think, you know, obviously, my portion of today's presentation is focused on monetary capital. Um, but I think both in the chat, as well as the few examples we just heard coming coming off mute, um, it's really about how do you leverage and potentially lean into a form of capital that you do have, um, or have a connection to so you may not have the direct monetary capital, um, but what about your, you know, uh, living experience? You know, are there folks in your network that you can connect to? Um, what about your social capital? There's different ways to get to the end game, and we'll talk about that more today. Um, we will be sharing the slides after today, and I did try to cite as much as I can uh, throughout the presentation, because obviously for brevity, um, can't go into super detail, but hopefully you'll have a chance to check out some of the resources after today. So I want to talk just a little bit about the state of capital, uh, particularly monetary capital and social change. Um, we all unfortunately share uh, this common thread of having lived through the summer of 2020 um, and even before that experiencing this global health pandemic uh, that we are still very much living in today. Um, but particularly, I want to hone in and focus on what we started to see uh, after the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and far too many people uh, that time today would not permit for us to, to name and honor, uh, but do want to acknowledge and honor those that have been lost here in our country. Um, but what we started to see in the summer of 2020 uh, sort of deemed the, the summer of social uprisings uh, was a lot of people entities, public entities, uh, private companies, nonprofits, lots of folks talking about the ways in which they can lean into racial justice. Um, I'm not going to go super deep because we heard Shamus this morning um, and huge fans of the folks there at Third Space. Uh, hashtag if you haven't checked out their training, please do. Um, but I think really I want to focus in on sort of the promises that were made and, and the lack of materializing of those promises that we're seeing today. Um, so we saw a multitude of statements, a multitude of declarations, and a multitude of actual dollars being pledged to be invested to address the issues as it relates to racial justice, and particularly thinking about those members of our community, pri primarily BIPOC members of our community that have been historically disenfranchised and marginalized for, for centuries, really, since the inception of this country. Um, but we're not quite seeing the materializing of those resources come to bear. And I bring this up not to be doom and gloom on a beautiful Friday morning, but just to level set that part of understanding capital, all forms of capital, is also thinking about accountability. Um, so again, time won't permit for me to go deeply into this, uh, but just a couple of recent reports. Actually, Washington Post was the first uh, last year in 2021 to essentially do an analysis to see whether or not all the pledges that were made in the summer of 2020, primarily by public institutions, whether or not they came to bear. Um, and that analysis revealed that 90% uh, really was focused on loans and investments, not necessarily grants. Um, and then there's been some further analysis this year that shows that uh, the money is not necessarily trickling down in the way that at least it was being communicated in the summer of 2020. Um, I think the other interesting uh, notion just to kind of elevate is about uh, how do we in fact hold institutions accountable, right? Who is the in entity or entities <laughs> that can actually uh, serve as a watchdog and actually ensure that these companies adhere to their promises? That's a really large charge. No one individual nor one in, uh, individual organization can do that. But I do believe it's our collective charge, uh, at least if we just kind of narrow into Ohio or even more specifically Cuyahoga County, uh, to think about how we as a collective can hold folks accountable when it comes to, again, the, the commitments and the pledges that they are putting forth as it relates to what our community needs. And just, uh, just kind of to further uh, expound upon that, right? So there were just tons of headlines uh, across the nation. And even here in our own backyard, we saw here in Cleveland in April of 2021, the George Gunn Foundation uh, announced the launch of the Ohio Climate Justice Fund. This is a positive example. Uh, this is an active fund that is prioritizing BIPOC members of our community and their organizations that are working on the intersection of racial justice and climate action. Um, our friends south of us, 
uh, down in Nelsonville. Um, also talked about a foundation in Appalachian, Ohio, receiving $50,000 in grants. Um, here in Cleveland, uh, the Cleveland Foundation created the Black Futures Fund. So it's not all uh, just lip service. Uh, we are seeing uh, these commitments materialize in a way uh, that, again, is really trying to address the historical challenges, but also look forward to how we can have more of an impact in our community. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into detail here because uh, Catherine covered uh, uh, many more examples of organizational structure. The only thing I will just note is that it is important to have a conversation, um, particularly if you're just getting started. Um, sometimes there may be a particular action that is prompting you and a group of individuals to come together. And at that moment, it may not necessitate that you think about your structure. Um, but as that particular idea or issue that you're trying to address starts to materialize, it is important that you identify if at some point you may need resources. Um, unfortunately, for, for most institutions, both public and philanthropic institutions, they are going to require that you have either a 501c3 or that you are fiscally sponsored by an incorporated nonprofit. Um, so that's just something for you to be cognizant of um, as your, your issue, your organization is forming uh, to make sure you're thinking about. So when you think about, you know, before you get to the actual grant proposal, I think it's really important to think about what is the capacity that your group organization has um, and how can you think about leveraging those different forms of capital. So for me, the first thing is really thinking about your organization's capacity. That's going to look different for everyone. Um, not everyone is going to have a formal grant writer or a fund development officer, um, but that doesn't mean that there are not folks within your organization that may, may or may not have the skills that you need to develop a proposal. Having a really dope, amazing writer, uh, you know, this may be someone who's not doing this as their day-to-day -day work, um, but in college or grad school, you know, they, they crafted their writing skills or their editing skills, right? So could you ask someone uh, on your team if they would be willing to serve in that capacity? In time, though, you probably want to try to make sure that you are building that capacity within your organization, um, either by raising more money <laughs> to be able to hire a fund development officer or a grant writer, or in some cases, contract with a grant writer. That's actually what Cleveland Votes does. Um, you know, the size of our organization and the activity level of our organization doesn't merit us having a full-time uh, development officer on staff right now. So we have opted to have a consultant on retainer that supports us in our grant writing. Um, it's also important to think about what free resources may be out there. Candid is a, a go-to resource uh, for a multitude of issues and topic areas uh, that nonprofits can tap into. Um, and they do have a number of proposal writing classes. Some of them are free. Some of them do require payment. I think their boot camp does require payment, payment excuse me. Um, but they also do have a lot of free resources available on their website. Um, the next suggestion I have is to conduct a power map. Um, so again, as we talked about earlier about our social capital, who do you know, right? Who in your community, your family, your friends, your professional network, either might be able to lend you some in-kind services or connect you with a funder uh, or donor that could be helpful and additive to your, to your organization. This is not the time to be shy. So when you start looking at, you know, the board list of a nonprofit or the board list of a foundation, and you're like, oh man, my uncle went to college with so-and-so, it's time to call the uncle <laughs> and say, what's good, right? Like, Remember that guy you went to college with? Like, when's the last time you talked to him? Can you give him a shout out real quick? Um, so again, this is not, this is about leveraging the relationships that you have. Um, and again, just, you know, again, looking at those board lists, looking at the staff list, seeing if there's any way that there's already a connection, because ultimately, as, as it has been said throughout this morning, relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, yes, it's about getting the money, but it's really about the path and the journey that you're gonna take to form a relationship with those funding sources. Um, so for me, these are just my tips, my guidelines. Uh, this is not uh, verified by any particular entity, but this is just what I have learned over the years. I've been in the nonprofit sector for some time now. Um, just knowing that most donors do have specific guidelines. Uh, folks may have heard of, of a term like a boilerplate proposal. Um, this is just, you know, sort of a generic, you know, basic information about your organization, the topic area that you're applying for. Um, and that's good to have that just maybe already written because then 
you can uh, extract from that to a specific funder. Um, but more often than not, the donor is going to have specific prompts or guidelines that they're seeking for you to fill out and complete. Um, as much as you can try to plan in advance uh, is always good. I shared with the group when we hopped on this morning that I had to be off camera in the beginning because I didn't plan far in advance and I have a proposal that's due today. So uh, even I, and in and, and the great ways I try to be proactive uh, doesn't always work out. So again, giving yourself as much time as you can uh, to, to go through this process so you do not feel rushed is always the best course of action. Um, I tend to think that philanthropic grants are a little less laborious uh, than, than public source grants, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, but things to look out for are like character limits, right? So more often than not, a proposal will actually say you, you can have this many characters or this many words. You could really uh, harm yourself <laughs> if you don't adhere to that. Um, and, it, and it literally comes down to like one character, two character. Um, so really as you're writing, making sure that you're checking the word count as you go along, because you would hate to you know, draft a beautiful narrative and then you know, have to copy and paste it into the portal and then realize that you have to cut some of that content because it exceeds the character limits. Um, government or public sources tend to have many more specific guidelines and parameters. Um, I tend to think they take much longer. Um, they usually do also have very short time timelines, uh, which I think is pretty unfair. Um, they're asking for more and giving you less time to complete it. Um, so again, just being cognizant of that. Um, and then it's always just good from an organizational standpoint to have some of your, your major organizational documents in one place. And again, this is going to look different for different types of organizations. Um, but knowing that there's some pretty standard documents you're always going to have to upload, your financials, a budget, you know, information about your board and staff. So again, just making sure those are current and up to date. Um, and then also being cognizant as you're thinking through, again, planning ahead if you can, um, you know, cr creating a timeline and a assignments for those that are going to be involved. Um, you know, I know in our case, we have a fiscal sponsor. So making sure that I'm giving that fiscal sponsor the heads up that we're going to be applying for a grant because we'll need certain documents from our fiscal sponsor. Um, in some cases, you know, making sure that you have current financials from your, from your CFO or from your accounting department. Um, so again, having a timeline and assignments and keeping everyone on track and someone who's going to be a great taskmaster and making sure that everyone's turning in their their information in a timely way. Um, so before I get into some of the specific type of funding that's that's available, I did want to spend a few minutes just talking about the power of narrative and storytelling. I think this has been somewhat of a thread throughout this morning's conversation. Um, relationships definitely have come up. And I think also just really, how are we as stewards and, and community servants really thinking about how we're elevating our story, not just for purposes of, of how that can attract money, um, but really how are we elevating our issues? So, you know, well in advance of preparing a proposal. I think it's really important for organizations to take time and think about how their story is being communicated. I know as a, as a donor, or excuse me, as a funder, both currently and in previous capacities, I do poke around the internet and see what's good about said organization <laughs> that's applying for money. Um, and I know that different organizations have different levels of capacity, so it's not to criticize, but it's always great if I can put an organization name into Google and I can see that they maybe have some social media, that they may have some articles that's referencing their work or press releases. Um, so again, that's well in advance of thinking about your specific proposal, but how are you elevating the story of your constituents, your community members, the issue that you're talking about? Story, um, and I won't go into super detail here, um, but just uh, to highlight a couple things about the, the importance of story as a tool, it's really about how we're connecting, right? If you just think about your day to day and how you're interacting with your coworkers, your children, your family, more often than not, you're, you're gravitated to something or someone by a story, right? I don't know about y'all, I don't have children, but I have eight nieces and nephews. Like, I remember hearing them tell stories coming home from school, and it's like captivating. Right. It's like, because in their world, you know, they're seven or eight years old and there's like nothing more important than like what happened on the playground. Right. Um, and, and to extrapolate that example, when you think about meeting someone in the 
community maybe for the first time and maybe this hasn't happened so much since covid but you know i know that random conversation at the coffee shop or you know the passerby conversation um, at a community meeting you more often not i don't always remember everyone's name because i'm hitting that age where i am starting to forget names but i always remember a face and i always remember the story so just really thinking about the importance of how you're capturing your organization's story or the story related to the issue that you are seeking to elevate or advocate for. All right, dollar dollar bills, y'all. So types of funding available, many types of funding all have different types of parameters around what they do, how they can support. Um, and obviously all time, the, the time today, excuse me, will not allow to go into super, super detail, but just wanted to highlight a few uh, that may be of interest. So individual donations and gifts are always amazing. And that can come in the form of money, that can come in the form of skills, and it can come in the form of time like volunteering. Um, so again, as you think about what your organization's capacity is, while yes, monetary donations are always preferred, um, there may be a way to leverage someone's skills or their time um, as it relates to enhancing the capacity of your organization. Crowdfunding or crowdsourcing is something that's been around for a number of years now. Um, there's major companies like Kickstarter and GoFundMe, um, but there's also some more socially focused uh, crowds, crowdfunding and crowdsourcing entities like IOB. IOB uh, is head headquartered out of Brooklyn, um, but they have an office here in Cleveland. And essentially the way they work is they have a platform where you can uh, pitch digitally on a website, your organization or your idea, and then and essentially IOB will match those resources. Um, and they've done different things over the years where they've also partnered with Neighborhood Connection. So there might be some additional resources coming from Neighborhood Connection. So that would be one I would check out. Um, Neighborhood Connections is another great example. They provide small dollar grants uh, throughout the year. Um, and then we've also seen, this is not a new concept, but I think it's uh, gained some renewed energy in the last couple of years, uh, mutual aid. Um, you know, we saw a, a plethora of these mutual aid opportunities presenting themselves again, going back to, to the summer of 2020 and to current, uh, current state. Um, and these are ways that people are responding, usually in a very time sensitive way, to a very specific need for either a very specific individual or a specific organization or cause. We have one here in Cleveland, Reparations Now, um, that's been around for the last couple of years. So I would highly recommend checking them out. And I believe uh, Lee Gates is on the line, who is also part of Reparations Now. Um, another not so new concept is giving circles. We have a couple of different giving circles here in Cleveland. More than not, giving circles are usually formed by friend or family networks. Uh, they are passionate about a particular issue um, and they want to be able to provide resources to organizations that are working on that particular issue. Um, so there's thousands of them across the country. These are just a few examples of some giving circles here in Cleveland that I would recommend. Um, and then lastly on this slide uh, is employer-based ba giving. So there are a number of entities in our community where an organization uh, can sign up to have donations sent to them. Um, so if I, Erica, would like to donate to reparations or they're not quote, the nonprofit, let me find that, Neighborhood Connections, let's say. <laughs> if I wanna donate to Neighborhood Connections, maybe my employer has an employer-based giving program and I can have either a specific dollar amount or a percentage of my paycheck go to that specific organization. Um, so just looking through those different websites like the Greater Cleveland Community Shares um, and or or ask your employer um, and see if that is an option that you have where you can be giving to a nonprofit or have your organization signed up to be on one of these type of sites. United Way also does something similar with their employer employer based um, giving as well. Um, from the public standpoint, uh, obviously there's and there and Catherine touched on a many of the many of these as well. But um, again, when you receive this slide deck, you'll be able to access these hyperlinks. Um, it really just depends on the issue that you're working on and the specific department that you may be seeking funding from. Um, but more often than not, just a flag for for many of the federal uh, or really for any of the government public sources. More often than not, there is going to be some type of registry that your organization is going to have to complete, like. 
at the federal level. Um, it's called DUNS. Don't ask me what DUNS stands for because <laughs> I forgot. Um, um, at the county level, uh, you'll sometimes, not sometimes, you will often have to sign up through the Office of Procurement to be a registered vendor uh, with the county as well as with the city in order to even go through the process of applying for these grants. So again, this, this speaks back to the, the importance of planning ahead as much as you can so you can make sure even before you get to the proposal that you've done any of the, the pre-registration that you need to do. Um, but again, these RFPs and RFQs or RFAs, depending on the entity, um, are publicly available on the, on the different government websites. Um, and just wanted to flag too, um, you know, with the American Rescue Act plan, both at the county and the city level, um, there's lots of lots of resources that are going to be deployed here in our region over the next couple of years. Um, so just highlighting uh, most recently Mayor Bibbs rescue and transformation plan. So you have a sense of where his administration will be focusing um, and also wanted to highlight participatory budgeting. Uh, this is a local coalition here in Cleveland that is really encouraging uh, both our city and county to think about how they can have a more participatory process to involve community as it relates to how the dollar are resourced uh, or redistributed, excuse me. I know that was mentioned earlier today as well. As it relates to the philanthropic sources, um, I just named a few here in our region, um, but you know, highly recommend you know, going to these individual foundation websites, signing up for their newsletters, checking uh, their grant schedule to see when their grant opportunities are available and when you might wanna consider applying. Um, and then I just noted a few here that are particularly focused on um, social justice uh, that may be of interest to you all. All right, so um, wrapping up here and kind of coming back to where we started with our hypothetical. Um, I know we've had much conversation and dialogue. Um, for me, when I evaluated the, the hypothetical and thought about its intersection with my portion of today's workshop, um, the first thing that came to mind for me is a community land trust. Um, I think when, when I read and sort of processed what was said um, in that particular hypothetical, for me, the first thing that was absent is agency for the residents, right? There's a lot of things happening around them. There's a lot of things happening for them, um, but how much of that do they actually have agency and ownership around? Um, so this concept is not a, a new concept. I think it's starting to, to take form uh, in, in many ways across the country, um, but it's just one tool, as, as Catherine noted, there's many tools to, to tap into that may provide an opportunity to maintain the integrity of affordable housing uh, for that particular neighborhood that was highlighted there. Um, I shared with the other panelists before we hopped on, I just read a, an article yesterday that was in Next City highlighting, I think an amazing story in LA, um, there was a, or is a um, large apartment building um, that was uh, essentially rent controlled and that rent control was uh, due to uh, lift, I believe in 2019. And prior to 2019, the residents uh, both in that building as well as in the neighborhood were organizing to try to ensure that the rents didn't go up. This is LA, we already know <laughs> like what the rents are out there. Um, and through their advocacy, through their organizing, uh, they ultimately just in the last couple of weeks were able to get the city to take out a loan to buy the apartment building so that they could maintain uh, that affordable rent for those particular residents, right? So this is really thinking about not just the, the monetary gain, um, but the intersection of agency and organizing and really listening to and speaking to what residents need in that particular moment um, and understanding that there are market forces that sometimes can have a resident feel like they don't have control. Um, so I think opportunities like today with Legal Aid's workshop, you know, how can we make this information more readily accessible to our residents? Um, Sham has talked about this obviously with the intergenerational lunch and learns that they've had at Third Space. For me, you know, it's about transferring knowledge, transferring power, right? If you are the beholder of information, the beholder of knowledge, what good is it if you just hold on to it? Um, so how do we, you know, really think about power and knowledge as a current? How how can we transfer that to others so that they have more knowledge and, and can really have more agency in their decision making? So with that, I will stop and say thank you and stop sharing so I can uh, see the crowd. Questions, comments, anything I can expound upon?
Erica, I was hoping you'd go back to um, fiscal sponsorship a little bit um, and maybe talk more about um, for newly forming groups, where would they start to look? How do you find a fiscal sponsor? Who are the um, organizations that provide that support to new and emerging entities? It is June of 2022, still can't find that button. Um, so I'll be honest, it's actually a little frustrating because there's not like a repository. Um, there's not one directory or one list of organizations that serve and operate as a fiscal sponsor. Um, more than not for me over the years, it's really by word of mouth. Um, so again, going back to our networks and our social capital, um, really thinking about um, you know who, who we may know that may know a fiscal sponsor. I literally uh, obtained Cleveland Bill's uh, most recent fiscal sponsor by just happened to be in conversation uh, with a program officer and they mentioned the organization name, which is Greater Cleveland Neighborhood Centers Association, and I had heard of them, but I did not know that they offered fiscal sponsor services um, and ended up contacting the ED and ta-da, here we are, right, for two, two plus years. So literally just by having a conversation with a colleague saying to them, oh, I'm trying to find a fiscal sponsor. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there's a few across the state. Um, um, and again, it really does come down to capacity, unfortunately. Many fiscal sponsors do not just solely fiscally sponsor organizations. They're, they're more often not operating another type of business. And then one of their services is offering uh, fiscal agency. I always tend to recommend actually checking with funders, um, like program officers at foundations. They tend to know a lot more about who is offering fiscal sponsor services. Um, as an example, like Ohio Voice, which is not Cleveland-based, um, they're statewide, um, headquartered in Columbus. Um, they work a lot with civic and voter engagement nonprofits across the state. Um, they do offer occasional fiscal sponsor uh, support to organizations, but you know they're like a six-member staff, right? <laughs> so it's not like they can fiscally sponsor thousands and thousands of nonprofits. Um, I actually think it's a gap, not just in Ohio, but across the nation. I think there should be a, a, a wider array of nonprofits that function this way um, because it often is a huge barrier for, you know, again, those coalitions or networks or groups that um, either have not incorporated or actually don't want to incorporate. There's a lot of work that goes into being an incorporated institution. Um, and sometimes folks don't wanna you know, take that burden on. Um, so that's another part of the layer I think of consideration is like, you know, once I become incorporated nonprofit, I need a board of directors, I need to make sure I have a budget and financials and conduct an audit and like all that stuff, tons of anxiety if you're me, right? <laughs> like, uh, like, I gotta do all that. I'm just trying to lobby to my council person to make this thing happen. And now I got to do all these other things, right? So um, lots of layers to the decision making and the unfortunate reality. And it's like, I don't have a solid answer because we just don't have a, a large menu of institutions that are at least publicly naming that they offer this as a service. You actually anticipated my question that I was mid typing, which was, is this a gap? Like, is this something that in terms of like building an ecosystem of resources and structures that support grassroots advocacy, we need more um, availability of fiscal sponsorship? And I, I think I heard you say, yes, we do need more of that. Yeah, and like fiscal sponsor plus, right? And I think it's really thinking about infrastructure capacity. So like folks may remember, I don't know, maybe like a decade ago, there was like this huge wave around collective impact and backbone organizations. It was like a thing that uh, groups like the Stanford Social Review and FSG were talking about. And, and I think there were some positive examples of that. I, I appreciate the notion around backbone capacity because as I just noted, if I'm a smaller capacity, size capacity organization and I need to raise money, right? in order to do the thing that I need to do, um, but I don't wanna take on that additional burden of you know having to get a CFO or having to conduct an audit. Like we did an audit for the first time this year, terrifying terrifying. <laughs> I was getting these messages. My armpits were sweating. I was like, 
I don't know these answers, right? It's like, I have worked at nonprofits where I had a CFO who handled that. Now I'm the ED. So apparently they want me to know the answers. That's apparently what the auditors wanted. <laughs> so it was terrifying. Thankfully, I have an amazing fiscal sponsor and I have an amazing CFO at that fiscal sponsor, you know, who helped me and worked you know, walked me through it. But again, that's not something that everybody wants to sign up for. So I do think that reimagining backbone functionality, not just for smaller grassroots, but I think it can even be extrapolated to other types of nonprofit, particularly if, if a set of nonprofits like CDCs are operating in a network way. Do I believe that each one of those CDCs need to have a CFO, an HR, a payroll? No, I don't personally um, think that all those functions are needed at each of those institutions. I think there could actually be one entity that does all of that backbone. Obviously, it would be a very large entity because, you know, in our case, we have 27 CDCs. But I also think about that uh, alleviation of burden on those executive directors and not necessarily having to account for those roles and their budget. Um, so that's more resources going directly to their respective service area or to be able to hire other, you know, community-based staff. Um, you know, we've seen this, you know, sort of merger model in, in like some of the health and human service institutions, right? So I just think it, I think we need to stretch our imaginations about the functionality of organizations at all, right? Both incorporated and non-incorporated and ultimately what's gonna allow them to function to optimize what they're trying to do and not be saddled by what is necessary. I'm not downplaying like the efficacy of, you know, having clean books and <laughs> proper HR protocols, like all those things are necessary, but um, sometimes the skill set is misaligned, right? I may not have that skill set, but I'm really strong over here on the action, you know, advocacy component. And I may not have someone in my network who can balance me out in that way. Erica, we have uh, Michael with a question. Michal, but Michal, that's right. sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I'd like to know what change, if you're seeing change in foundations on how they approach small grassroots um, organizations since the pandemic, because as an agency that was pretty small, even though we're 118 years old, we, we flew under the radar and it's only like past decade that we're really getting foundation grants. But I will tell you, I struggled until I got that first grant from a large foundation. It took that until all the others then came on board. Like nobody was willing to be the first. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that the pandemic is, is changing some things and that they're seeing the, the importance of grassroots, smaller organizations and what they can do. But um, I don't know what you're seeing. Yes and no. So I think, you know, some of the examples I provided earlier, you are seeing some foundations make making, you know, really significant changes in their priorities and the ways in which they do their grant making, simplifying their grant making. And you have others that are still on their journey, right? Um, and I think as practitioners, right, the folks that are doing the work, our patients, let me, let me not speak for the group, my patients sometimes <laughs> is not the greatest, right? Because I'm like, the need is now, right? Like right now, like right this second, knocking at my door, right? So um, you know, I, I do have a view, I guess, in perspective as having served as a funder that I am, I can say with confidence that I am seeing changes as practitioners. Is, is the change happening at the pace that we would want? Maybe not, if I'm being honest, right? Um, but, I, but I do think that there are significant changes happening. And I do think that not that we as practitioners should bear this responsibility, but, you know, I think seeing changes even on like the board configuration of some of our local Northeast Ohio foundation boards, right? Like that makes an impact. It doesn't maybe, you may not see the immediate impact, but having a more diverse um, board representation is also going to play into the expediency in which that particular found in the cases of foundations in uh, the way that they're moving, right? If they have more individuals with direct lived proximate experience to the issues that they're facing in their community, the hope, right, is I, I don't have evidence of this, but the hope is that, you know, there's going to be more rapid change. Um, I think, you know, some concrete examples uh, that, that I've seen. So like I mentioned before, the Cleveland Foundation, you know, uh, creating the Black 
Black Futures Fund that's just occurred in the last couple of years, um, seeing foundations expand their portfolio areas or focus areas. So for instance, Fowler Family Foundation, they did a deep dive in 2020. They had not been previously funding organizations in the criminal justice space. They added that as a priority to their pillars in um, early 2021. So I think we do actually have some really positive examples, um, but again, I would, I would encourage you to check out some of the reports I cite. They're not materializing though in the same way that the pledges were coming out verbally and in written form, right? In, in the summer of 2020. And that's where, again, like, we as practitioners bear a, a tremendous amount of burden because we have to do the work and we have to advocate to get the money to do the work. That's just the reality. And there's a question in the chat from Catherine. She says, I'm curious about how funders approach social enterprises that may be organized as a for-profit or a non-charitable non nonprofit. Actually, Catherine, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't had any specific uh, experience with funders. I'm not a social enterprise um, and I haven't had any specific uh, experience with funders on that particular topic, unfortunately. And in the gap spotting, uh, it seems that there may be a gap in, in those uh, organizations who don't fit easily into either the for-profit or nonprofit uh, framework at least in Ohio. Any other burning questions or reflections? All right, well, thank you all again. Thank you so much.